half years, we've seen a million riders, or close to it, and supporting 7,800 full-time jobs. In Paris, three years, 500,000 riders, and 3,700 jobs. You say, well, that's amazing growth. Those are substantial numbers, but what happens when we continue to grow? San Francisco right now is growing 3x year over year, New York City 4x year over year, London 5x, 6x year over year. And so what happens in the coming years? How many jobs, how many unemployed and underemployed people can come onto this platform and find a way to make a living, to be part of an economic opportunity, which is not just, of course, putting food on the table for their family, but making their city better at the same time. And so in Paris, a great example where, you know, it's not just about getting people where they want, when they want, it also is an incredibly good complement for existing transport options. So in Paris, uh, the metro, of course, is everywhere in Paris. But 15% of all of our rides either pick up or drop off more than a kilometer away from where the metro stops. And so what that means is, by complementing the existing infrastructure that's in place, we're actually extending the ability uh, for public transportation or mass transit to, to serve people. And so with this, with this success we've seen in many cities, there's just four of, of dozens of examples or even hundreds, um, we can go to any mayor in any city. Maybe we want to partner with that mayor, maybe we're not in that city yet. And we can say, look, if we can find a way to partner up, find a regulatory framework that works for, for making this a reality, we can promise you 10,000 jobs in four years. And the vision for what that means in six years or 10 years, you're, you're talking about tens of thousands of jobs. You're talking about reduced congestion, of course, reduced pressure on parking, um, more efficiency on your existing mass transit options. See, we're starting to hit that that inflection point at a certain size where the impact that we can bring to cities is huge and we have proof points that we can talk to these mayors about. And so for us, it's like, well, why, not, why aren't we in every city? Why are there certain cities that it just doesn't quite work out? Well, it starts with old transportation rules that are governing essentially an analog economy, right? It's easy to sort of, you know, flippantly, you know, flippantly say something negative, let's say, about a particular law uh, that is keeping progress from happening. But there are a number of them that serve their purpose. In a world where you get into a taxi and there's no technology, you have a random person getting into a random person's car. And it's important to protect that person's safety. And so what did you have? You had color schemes on, on taxis so they're identifiable. You knew that it was a legitimate taxi for that city. You had meters in the car so that you knew what you were going to pay when you finished that ride. But what happens when you have new technology? When you have new technology, these rules maybe don't make as much sense. But in addition to those old analog rules that did have a purpose, what we've seen over decades is that there's been almost like a regulatory capture. There's been a situation where uh, we had a good set of rules that protected people, but then a whole new set of rules which protected an industry. For example, in New York City, there, are 13, 000, there were 13,250 taxis in the 1950s. We're now 60 years later, and there are 13,250 taxis in New York. How did that happen? It happened because uh, the existing incumbent industry made sure it did. They wanted to create uh, sort of artificial scarcity. What it means is that the average driver who wants to make a living can't go do so on his own. He has to ask for permission. And when he asks for permission, the taxi company says, sure. That will cost you $140 a day. What that means is that a driver spends $40,000 renting a car every year. He should be driving around in a Bentley. But for that privilege of spending 40 grand a year, he gets to be impoverished. And that is the taxi industry that exists in not just cities in the US, but cities around the world. 
Uh, we have other kinds of rules. Uh, there's a rule here in Germany called return to garage. So if you're familiar with a, a black car service or a chauffeured service, technically, that driver, let's say you call him up and he's supposed to come pick you up, that driver has to go back to the, his garage and park and then come back to you to pick you up. That is what the law says. Uh, we have one or two cease and desist that mention this rule. Um, in France, there was, a lo there was a decree that came down. It was what was called the 15-minute rule. So that if you requested a car, whether it be on an app or a phone, and the car came in just a few minutes, there was a 15-minute rule that said you could not enter that vehicle until 15 minutes had passed. Why do these rules exist? They exist because the existing taxi industry is trying to protect itself through, let's call, regulatory capture or legislative capture. The, one of my most favorite rules, and I'll, I'll, I'll get moving, is in South Korea. Chauffeured car service in South Korea is totally legal as long as the passenger is not Korean. <laughs> so if you are Japanese and you are in South Korea and you, get, you can take chauffeured limo, limo service all day long, you are obeying the law. But if you are South Korean, it is illegal for you to have a nice ride that you pay a fair price for. So in many cities, the job of driving for a living has become a protected monopoly, right? A protected monopoly means there are more cars on the road, more traffic, higher unemployment, and a bigger carbon footprint. It's not serving the city, it's not serving its citizens, it's serving a few people who own the incumbent industry. And so when new technology comes out, that means new rules are necessary. Mobile tech and GPS tracking mean we don't have to hail a car anymore. There's no longer a situation where an anonymous person is getting into another anonymous person's car. You have a service in the middle, you know, app, an app like Uber, and there are, of course, competitors that sit in between, branded services that sit in between the rider and the driver that now can be accountable to both. But that doesn't mean that we just enter a world where there's no regulation at all. I think, in fact, though the old rules don't work, the policy principles that drive these rules are the same. One, you want to safeguard rider and driver safety. Two, promote choice and competition so that consumers are served. Three, encourage economic growth and tax revenue. If you accomplish those three things, I think I think most of us would agree that you have a good regulatory framework. And so what are the regulations that, that align with these principles? I mean, we have gone to cities around the world, in fact, you know, spent a lot of 2014 working with cities around the world to make this a reality. Background checks, for instance, um, in the U.S., we have national background checks, city, county background checks, motor vehicle record check, basically zero tolerance for any drug or alcohol offense, reckless driving, or any felony at all. Insurance. You want to make sure that, in any case, that the, the driver and the rider feel protected no matter what happens. Coverage. It's important to make sure that we have coverage that goes beyond what is required for private cars. This is something, of course, we promise all our users, but something that is, is important for a regulatory regime to also codify. Choice and competition. Choice, allow platforms to connect con a consumer to any transportation provider at different price points, not just a taxi. Give drivers the freedom to choose multiple flat platforms to make a living. A lot of times drivers are locked into one platform, and when that happens, let's say it's the taxi industry, 